Welcome back to First Church of God. I am glad that you joined us today. Uh, what a great time I've had just recently getting to see a lot of family, but it is so good to be home. And if there's some place I enjoy, it's being home with you. Uh, well, you all matter and we're all very important. I want to talk to you today uh, with a title of Reach. Uh, years ago, I was subscribing to a magazine called Leadership Magazine, and it was a great magazine, had some great articles, uh, and in this one section, there was always sermon illustrations, and I'm a person that I like illustrations, I like stories, I like using stories, because I think stories kind of communicate to us, or they take us a little bit on an angle to help us to understand something better. Well, when you would read the illustrations, they were all good, and then at the end, there was this little paragraph that said you could submit an illustration to them, and if they published it, they would send you a little stipend for that. Uh, it was the freelance writer's uh, reward for sending something in. So I worked really hard on an illustration that I had been thinking about and or something that had happened in my life, and I made sure words were spelled right, the grammar was as good as I could get it, and I put it in an envelope, I put postage on it, and I sent it away. Several months later, I received an envelope from Leadership Magazine, and it said that what I had submitted did not meet their standards or what they were looking for when it came to illustrations, so they were not going to use my illustration. Rejection. I probably held on to that letter of rejection a little bit longer than I should have. Um, and so what I've learned from that experience, as well as some others, what seems like man's rejection might be God's protection. And it may not just be God's protection, it may be God's process of humbling us and preparing us. And maybe that was just a little seed in my life that grew into something bigger down the road. So what seems like man's rejection might be God's protection or God's developing of us in our life. Sometimes we hold on to rejection a lot longer than we should or what would be considered healthy. And I think what we need to figure out and what I'm figuring out is if we thank God for his protection, that's the first step of letting go of the rejection. No matter where you turn today, you're going to find we are a people and a country uh, that is divided and worried. The division of our nation, the division between families and friends, it is so sad. And sometimes that what we're doing is we're thinking we're punishing them when actually we're hurting them. We need to be loving them. And it's totally the opposite. This, this whole... Um, disunity, this whole division thing is so opposite of what Jesus prayed for. There is one prayer request of Jesus that never got answered. He says in the garden just before his death, Father, may they be one, you and me. May we be one as he and God are one. May we have this unity. May we have this community. May we have this connection where we're not putting up walls of division, but we're putting up bridges of coming together. People are fighting with each other. Marriages are ending way too quickly and easily and foolishly. Suicide rates are at their highest, and many people have lost hope, and many people have given up. And we can point the finger. We can say, well, it's because of the pandemic. It's because of politics. It's because of unemployment. It's due to unrest. It's due to this. It's due to that. It's due to a bad childhood. Whatever. I mean, you can point your finger any way you want. But the root of the matter is much deeper than we realize. Not only do we need a renewing of our mind, we need a renewing of our soul. At the end of the root, it's Satan. There is, the, the truth is, evil exists all around us and even in most of us. The enemy's goal, according to the Word of God, is to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy seeks to defeat us through, we call them five Ds, doubt, distortion, discouragement, distraction, and division. Doubt distortion, 
discouragement, distraction, and division. Since we know that this is his strategy, it would do us good to admit that he is real, and we need to get an understanding of his weapons. We must admit that there is a spiritual battle and that you and I are the target. Not only are you the target, he knows that if he can take you out, he can take others out. He knows if he attacks this person within the church, it hurts me. It hurts the others of the church. If you get wounded, I get wounded. So we, what his mission is, he is out to create doubt, distortion, discouragement, distraction, and division among families, among churches, among a nation. I want us to look at an individual who was going through definitely doubt, definitely discouragement, and a lot of distraction. We find their story in the book of Mark, the fifth chapter, starting verse 24. Let's follow along with me. If you have your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 4. Uh, listen, if you would, please. It says that Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel her body, uh, feel in her body that she had been healed of the terrible condition. Jesus realized at once the healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched me? Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then a, the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell at her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Wow, what great news. And so this woman, if you look at her, she was a woman of, at a point of despair. Where there is despair, there is disgrace. Her issue was more than just a medical issue because it was a physical issue as well. It affected her spiritually. It affected her social life. The law of Moses said that if you had this kind of condition or anything near like it, you had to stay away from everyone. You couldn't go into the temple and worship because you were unclean. Now, I think that with all of this, it carried some shame. Shame does not come from God. It comes from man. It comes from Satan. And, and anywhere she went, everybody was afraid of her. I mean, she could have had leprosy and it would have been just as bad. They were afraid that they would get whatever her problem was. Her family, most likely, had to let her go. We can't take care of you anymore. We can't be part of you. We don't want to get what you got. Uh, they, they couldn't help her any longer. She didn't have any backup. She didn't have money. She didn't have a husband. She didn't have children to take care of her. She didn't have hope. And her future, in her eyes, not far away. What I believe is that when there is a need sensed by a few and everyone does their part, God does a miracle. What had felt like over 12 years of man's rejection of her left her at the end of her rope. Matthew 5, 3 of the Message Bible reads, You are blessed when you are at the end of your rope, for with less of you there is more room for God and his work. She went against the norm of everyone else that day. She took a great risk to even be out in public. She knew she had to be as stealth as possible, possibly weak physically, not just from poverty, but from the blood loss. Uh, she crawls through the crowd. She reaches out. She's not sure. I mean, I don't know if she could see Jesus. Maybe she just noticed the color of his garment. But she reached out and she touched it. And at the same time, both Jesus and her felt something different. She had suffered greatly because of the many doctors. 
we don't have the issue she had. But we can all at times have times of desperation, which leads to distraction, which leads to disgrace, which is part of despair. We may not have the same physical issue, but when a soul is sick, people often go to different doctors and spend a great deal of time and money only to suffer many more things from these physicians. A sick soul may go to Dr. Entertainment only to find no cure. They may pay a visit to Dr. Success, but he's no help in the long run. They go to Dr. Pleasure and Dr. Self-Help and Dr. Religion, and none of those find a cure because there's really only one that can cure us, and we know who that is. It's Dr. Jesus. Now, they're, they're, I came across this cool story. There are beaches along the coast, and uh, these certain beaches are ideal for the sea turtles to come in and lay their eggs. So between um, uh, May and August, the mother sea turtles come in, they dig this nest, they lay their eggs, they cover it back up, they go back out to sea. Months later, the little eggs hatch and the baby turtles come out of the sand and they look for the pure light. And they follow the pure light of the moon back into the surf. Now, in a perfect world, the pure light is the moon, and it guides every turtle back to the safety of the ocean. It is the sea turtle hatchling's instinct to crawl towards the brightest light. On an undeveloped beach, the brightest light is always going to be the pure light of the moon. But on these developed beaches where a lot of these sea turtles are landing, there are artificial light sources. There are restaurants. There are homes, condominiums, uh, all along the coast creating this fake light, this artificial light. And unfortunately, those artificial sources of light, the hatchlings are not smart enough to know which are real and which are artificial. And it causes them to move in the wrong direction when they were born into more danger. And rather than following the pure light of the moon uh, the, the, and, and going into the ocean, they follow the wrong light coming to a disastrous end. And don't we do the same thing? When there is despair in our life, rather than following the path where we, uh, where we were meant to be, we follow and we reach out to the wrong light. We are distracted by the many things that move us in the wrong direction. Our technology, our social media, uh, uh, media in general, bad habits, addiction, stress, busyness, and meaningless distractions, they lead us off the path and they lead us into danger. They move us away from the real relationships into imaginary relationships. They, um, Rather than following the light of Christ, we choose to follow the shiny objects that take us way off course. Let me give you the good news. One of the many differences between us and sea turtles is we have the ability to think. We have the ability to adapt. We have the ability to change direction when we realize that we're on the wrong path. We can choose to tune out the distractions and focus, on, uh, focus our priorities and let the light of Christ lead us to new hope. I think that the tipping point or the turning point of this miracle of Jesus is when he looks at her and he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. What a great verse. She immediately went from being known as an outcast, a nobody, no personal name, stay away from her, sick one, whatever they called her, all of a sudden she has a new name. She immediately felt freedom, adoption, no longer a stranger. She had a new family. He called her daughter. What a great title. When Jesus said, your faith has made you well, some verses say healed. The Greek word here is sozo. And it is the word uh, used in Romans 10, 13, when it says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And it means that we no longer, she was set free from her affliction. It was gone. She was restored. She was made well. She was healed. She was given a new name. And Jesus made her more, it more made it more than just healing. She, she went from no longer being allowed to go to the temple. She now had front row seats seats. She could interact with other people. She could get married. She could have children. And the list of her dreams were now being fulfilled. 
Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And that's exactly what Jesus does in this passage. He fulfills the law. When he called her daughter, she had this new identity. She belonged to someone. And when we repent, when we receive Christ as our Savior, we get a brand new identity in Christ. Not in things, not in people, not in titles, not in positions, but in Christ. And that can never fade away. That can never be taken away. John 1, 12 says, But to all who believe in him, to accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. It's a right, not a privilege, and we cannot abuse that right. Jesus also said in Romans 8, in John 8, 38, if the Son has set you free, you shall be free indeed. In this miracle, her strength, her skin color, her health returned all at one time. She didn't have to wait. She was a new person. And it all started with this brave move to reach out beyond what anyone else would think and touch the only one who could make a difference. Now, I think maybe for our healing, we don't just need to reach out to Jesus, but I think we need to reach out to others as well. Maybe what we want for ourselves is what somebody else is needing, and we need to give it to them. It's exactly what we are wanting, and when we give it to them, we get what we're wanting. If we're wanting fellowship, rather than waiting for others to come to us, we need to go to them. If we need touch, we need to reach out. Uh, what we want from others, we need to start giving, and we will find that we are receiving at the same time we are giving. The woman in this miracle, she had faith that Jesus could heal her. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith calls for sacrifice. Sacrifice is an action. And to increase your faith requires sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to set aside time to read, meditate, and absorb God's word, to put it into practice. And if you skip any of those, you create a weak spot, an area for the enemy to bring in doubt and discouragement, distortion, distraction. When I think of the enemy's weapons of doubt, distraction, discouragement, uh, division, there is some tactics he used. These are the same tactics he used in the garden with Adam and Eve. Uh, they were told not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was a second tree not too far from there, and it was the tree of life. There were no restrictions on it. The lie of the five Ds caused them to reach for the lower line fruit. Do what's easy. And doing what's easy does not require much effort on our part. And it will always give us the greatest and quickest self-fulfillment, but only for the short term. And it is only temporary satisfaction from the far from the truth, and it will leave us disappointed. What do you need to do different in your life? to create an authentic relationship, authentic conversations, true unity with each other as Jesus prayed for. What would it look like if in your, in your life you started reaching for higher fruit, passing the tree of the short-term satisfaction for the long-term form of eternity? For some, it might begin with monitoring how much screen time that you have between your phone, social media, television, and other influences. How many hours... How many more hours do you engage with solo media influences compared to human connection? What would it be like to have an active conversation with someone else where both of you are truly heard and understood? How much time would you spend physically interacting with other humans? Um, how much time you spend Physically interacting with other humans reflects the time that you spend interacting with God. I've said many a times that uh, we have to move beyond the, hi, how are you today, where we don't care, and get out of the rut of saying the same thing over and over and over, expecting a different result. It means we've got to begin to engage our brain and by, by engaging our heart first. Another thing to consider is we battle the five Ds and how to overcome them. Here's how we overcome them. First of all, we have to trust. We've got to place our trust in Jesus Christ, and we need to begin trusting one another. I want you to think long and hard on this question. How many transparent friendships do you have? 
How many people do you have in your circle of friends that you can have a completely transparent and honest conversation with and not be judged by them and you not judge them? And them not tell you how to live your life. You can just vomit on them and they're okay with that. How many? Here's the second thing we need to do. We need to trust. And then we also need to speak the truth. We live in a time where everyone is offended by being offended. Ephesians 5, 14 says, Instead, speak the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. We need to speak the truth. We need to quit being fluff and be real. Not critical, not condemning, but the truth in love. Showing that we care. Number three, we need to encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, be an encouragement to one another. How are you encouraging someone? Honestly, truthfully encouraging them. Number four, focus on focus. And the, the only way that we can focus is if we stand up to the distractions and figure out what is real and what is fake, what is good and what is healthy. In fact, really, the simple thing is, what does Philippians 4, uh, 7 say? 7 and 8. It said, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is, it's 4, 8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. We need to focus on the truth. We need to focus on what is real, not what is phony, and not get offended when somebody doesn't like your post. Number five, unite. Unite. Colossians 3.14 says, And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This verse doesn't just tell us what to do. It shows us how to do it. Put on love, real love. Not what's in it for me, but how can I live out 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, keep no records of wrong and to love as Christ loved us. So which of these five might you put into practice this week in an effort to defeat the enemy and to rise above the five Ds. It's up to you. You can do it. Christ is with you.